Hello, welcome. I've uh, wanted to do this video for a while. So we currently live in a very connected world. Like with YouTube, we have people here from Aotearoa, New Zealand, the United States, the UK, Australia, Japan, France, Germany, Europe, China, India and elsewhere. We can speak directly to one another and being universal as our reality. We have to acknowledge this universality. I think dialogue is relatively easy and while there are cultural differences, there is a shared space for dialogue, probably more so than any time in recorded history and likely we're more culturally homogenous. I have done a lot of vlogs on Christian writers, but now I want to venture into Hinduism, Vedanta, the spiritual traditions of Bharat or India, however you want to refer to it. I'll use the term Vedanta from now on. This has a personal connection for me. I grew up in a secular household. Both my parents grew up in Anglican households, but our family had moved away from the wider family. We didn't attend church. And I didn't even know people that were strongly religious. Even now I don't know that many. Although there are two operating churches in this town, they're hardly flourishing. Growing up I wasn't drawn to Christianity. Although Tolkien's fiction had a strong influence on me, it was really Vedanta that was first real to me. And it was through that that any appreciation of Christian spirituality was born in me. In cultural terms, it's interesting for me to trace Vedanta in recent history. The Theosophists spoke of Vedanta in the late 19th century. But while I find Blavatsky an interesting figure, I don't find their writings very clear or illuminating. There are a number of significant modern Vedantic figures. Ramana Maharshi, Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, Paramahansa, Yogananda, Sri Aurobindo and Prabhupada. The English writer Arthur Osborne wrote a number of books on Ramana Maharshi, as well as one on Shirdi Sai Baba. And Paul Brunton claimed Ramana Maharshi was his guru and his pretty popular book, A Search in Secret India. Sri Ramakrishna came figuratively to the West through his key devotee Swami Vivekananda, who attended the First World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893. And the story of his going there is an interesting one, as he represented India there. But he came with no formal accreditation, as was required, and hadn't realized he needed it. But through certain interesting events it all worked out, and he was probably the most momentous speaker there. And he spent quite a while in the United States and established Vedanta centers there. Vivekananda, interestingly, emphasized how there is truth in all religions and used the quote from the Bhagavad Gita. As different streams having their sources in different places all mingle their waters in the sea, so, O oh Lord, the different paths which men take through different tendencies, various though they appear, crooked or straight, all lead to thee. Not that long afterwards, in 1920, Paramahansa Yogananda came to the United States and for the most part lived there for the rest of his life, establishing the Self-Realization Fellowship. He, like Vivekananda, arrived with little money and no contacts. Yogananda wrote the usually influential book, Autobiography of a Yogi. His tradition, the teachings through the line of his guru, was called Kriya Yoga. Yogananda has made his place in popular culture. His line of gurus were included in the figures on the Beatles classic Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Interestingly, my family has a nice tie with this album. It dates back earlier than Vivekananda's visit to the United States back in 1856. Pablo Fanke, who was featured in the song Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite, toured New Zealand and my great-great 
grand uncle uh, organized a visit to this area where I live in Kapiti. George Harrison, who was responsible for Yogananda appearing on the Beatles cover, used to have piles of the copy of the autobiography of a yogi and would give them away to his friends and acquaintances. The Mahaguru, at the start of Yogananda's lineage, Babaji, is celebrated in a song on the Supertramp album, even in the quietest moments, which had a real appeal to me. The brother of one of my school friends had a copy of this album. I think George Harrison's song, Dear One, is about Yogananda. I was also, from a young age, a fan of the group Yes, and their album, Tales from Topographic Oceans, was based on a footnote from Yogananda's autobiography of a yogi. The singer from Yes, John Anderson, has as his guru someone called Mother Aubrey, who had as her spiritual ideal Sri Ramakrishna, again Vivekananda's guru. When I was about 30 years old, I read Autobiography of a Yogi. I don't know that I was aware of the Beatles, Yes, or Supertramp connections. I was interested in reading spiritual books, but spirituality didn't really live for me. It felt like there was something of an abyss between me and spirit God. This book changed that. Yogananda seemed to have and be able to convey having a living, personal and easy relationship with God. This came to me at a time when I desperately needed it. I was suffering from depression and alienation from the spirit, which was becoming intolerable. Some decades later, I was initiated into Kriya Yoga by Swami Samapanananda, now about 10 years ago, and I have twice had spiritual retreats with the current Guru, Paramahansa Pragnanandaji. The tradition, luckily for a lover of books like myself, has a healthy literature. Pragnanandaji has written a lot of books, Yogananda too. His brother disciple Satyananda wrote a set of biographies of the masters. Pragnananda's guru Hariharananda wrote a number too. Yogananda's guru Sri Yukteswa wrote one called The Holy Science. And Pragnanandaji wrote a commentary on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali based on the interpretation of the scripture by Sri Yukteswa's guru Lahari Masaya. I'll make a few general comments about Vedanta. Now one of the things I believe about religion generally is that it didn't used to be considered as a set of beliefs. It was descriptive of actual experiences and could not be abstracted from other realms of life. Really only since modern times, especially from the end of the Middle Ages, the concept of the secular has opened up and we have come to conceive of religion as a set of beliefs as something that could be abstracted from other realms of life. I'll now outline some key Vedantic concepts and practices, which I think really are reflected in most religions. Dharma, Bhakti, Seva, Satsang, Dhyana and Jnana. Your Dharma is your path and could be translated as right conduct, speaking truthfully, compassion. We live with the gunas or qualities, tamas, rajas and sattva, or sloth, anger and purity. The first two are negative qualities, but even the last must eventually be transcended. Bhakti is devotion, prayer and devotional singing. Seva is service to others, particularly the poor. Satsang is good company. Get-togethers with other devotees. Dhyana, or meditation, is practice, and in Kriya Yoga, with initiation, we are taught a specific meditation practice. And Jnana is wisdom, the study of the scriptures, but more importantly, the realization of them. And none of these are really separate from one another. For instance, in Jnana, we are to realize our true nature is divine, and in Seva, or service to others, we are acting on this, by recognizing the divinity in others. Much like what Jesus said, what you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. David Bentley Hart wrote an excellent book, The Experience of God, 
which compared the concept of God from Christianity, the God of classical theism to that of Islam, and the Vedantic conception of Satchitananda, or being, consciousness, and bliss. If God is essentially the same in these traditions, then the metaphor of different paths to the one destination seems appropriate. I make no claims to be a wonderful exemplar, and atheists often point to less than perfect behaviour of religious people as being instances of hypocrisy. And while that may sometimes be the case, often it isn't. Religion is for the imperfect. Accepting teachings does not immediately mean you can fully live up to them. Hypocrisy is when you complain of the behaviour of others that you do yourself. I want to finish by coming back to the start. I think we are now in a time when we can no longer ignore the fact that there are various religious traditions. And it may be that sincere practitioners of disparate traditions may find more in common than with many practitioners of those supposed to be within their own faith. Thank you for listening.